months in which I studied uh, the general sciences there and was quite experienced in studying abroad at that time in the University of Ilyese in Nigeria. I came back to the University of Pittsburgh, stayed there for my last part of my stay there, uh, my last year there, and then I went to Los Angeles, California, in which I uh, moved and stayed with my mother and my other ten brothers and sisters and trained them into the martial arts. Because I started the martial arts at the age of nine. This year was then for well, me. My study in the arts of martial arts for 51 years now. I'm 50 years of age. And the martial arts, of course, is the foundation of my life, giving me a lot of strength, a lot of uh, positive interaction with myself and other people, of course, confidence and self uh, assurance. Now, when I came back and moved to Los Angeles, as I was saying, I kind of saw the differences in different religions and studying Zion Buddhism and Islam and many other different religions, and I was getting kind of disenchanted. I said, oh my God, our people in these conditions, and God, would you let us be like this? Why? And I was questioning God. So, however, I got a position in teaching and became the director of the Mofundi Institute, which was a cultural institute in the heart of Watts, on the 103rd and Wilmington, uh, uh, in Watts, California. And I became a director there, and I worked with many game programs and brought many games uh, entities together. And the brothers started a group called Brothers Unlimited, which was funded by the United States Corporation. And it began going around for telling gang activity. This was a combination of the Christmas, the Bishops of Power Rooms, the Dalai Lama, uh, and many other uh, uh, gang factions to come together to cease that deadly madness and trend of self destruction. We went to the mountains and took them to the beaches and let them get out to, got them out of the inner city to get them more exposure to nature, the big bear mountains and desert field trips. So it was a lot of worthwhile experience there. But back to the clubs. I used to take the brothers also to the teaching in the Watts Temple uh, in uh, Watts, California. And there was a brother named Brother Vernon, who's now also named Brother Shahid, that uh, used to come pick up my brothers and meet us at the mosque and, and watch, and I still was wavering in the nature kind of, I knew, and I began to listen more, there was something there. And of course, when I was in Nigeria, I would listen to brothers say, brothers, I was studying and being pan-Africanized, so I was thinking of being the pan african movement, and the brothers in Nigeria said, brothers, we don't want to hear nothing but the teachers of the Amadou Elijah Muhammad, because they, we try to identify with them culturally, but they knew that it took a business and more of a mission from us. They looked up to us as a, a people here in the hell of North America. They knew that we were the ones to fulfill the scriptures. However, when I was in Los Angeles, I received word from one of my students that he was having a son and asked me to be the God father of his son. His name was God, and his father's name was Chris. I also received information from my brother in uh, Bill Boston, who was the uh, assistant dean of Boston University, to be the godfather of his son in Boston, Massachusetts. His name uh, was uh, Robert Scott. Uh, by the way, I haven't given you my name. I'm sorry. My name today is I'm known as Master Shahid. And I'm known in different parts of the country as Rasan. I was born with the name Bobby Scott in Henderson, North Carolina. I received the name of Kweku Basu in Ghana, and I also received the name of Rasan uh, Oladum uh, in Nigeria. So I have received different names when I wear them. So the name that I wear now is Shahid, which means one who bears witness to truth. And I'm bringing this to bear witness to the truth that of an experience that I have lived, and I'm going to come to that point now. While I was um, in L.A., I was sitting in my apartment in Hollywood, and I, I was um, listening to, it was in February, the day the messenger physically left us, and I was sitting in my apartment watching, I think it was a basketball game from TV, and to the radio to my left, I was listening to Stevie Wonder's 
radio station called KJLH, and they were updating every 15 minutes. They were updating the flight of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad from Mexico to Mercy Hospital in Chicago. And every 15 minutes, the pilot, Sultan Muhammad, who was the messenger's grandson, was calling in, uh, but they were updating his flight pattern as well as his location, Texas, Oklahoma, and let's forget, as he was making his way to Chicago, then being a messenger to the hospital. So I was listening intensely to that radio station at that time, as well as the uh, game, of course. But as I looked out my window toward the east, and it was very cloudy that day, and I looked out the window, and it was very cloudy, and I saw a patch of blue sky come through the, the cloud, fill it away, and a patch of blue sky, and as I did, there was a picture or a vision of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that broke through the clouds. I'm like, whoa, what do I see? I looked around in the apartment. There was not a picture of the messenger at that time. So I think there was a reflection. So I looked around again. I rolled my eyes. And I looked again. The clouds flew away. And there was a picture of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad stretched up. Like a bus picture from his head up. Very clear what it said. And I was like, whoa, you know. So my fiance at that time, Jan, she came in the door uh, with Tasha, uh, Dora, and she closed the door and I said, listen, I need the keys to the car. And she said, where are you going? I said, I need to go out to watch to see my youngest brother's father, who was in Barco, who was well known in the watch area. 